Thank you for the very kind introduction, for taking the time out of a busy semester. Uh, thank you for inviting me, both of you, to hosting me and organizing this event. Uh, it's really a thrill to be back. So one thing that wasn't in the introduction is maybe the most important thing, I went here. Uh, so I was a graduate student from 1999 to 2004. Uh, so I, uh, I love coming back whenever I get a chance to. And uh, uh, I'm still immensely loyal to Notre Dame and was at the UVA game last Saturday. <laughs> um, so anyone else there at the game? Uh, um, well, 28 to three, that's all you need to know. Um, <laughs> great win and uh, we'll keep it going with Georgia Tech this weekend. So um, good to see you. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Students, how many students we got? <clears throat> Excellent. So one thing students, uh, I'm gonna call on you a couple times and then during the Q&A, you're gonna get the first shot on questions. So I really wanna hear what you have to say. So just be thinking about questions that you wanna ask during the question and answer period. All right, um, one last preliminary is that I am a philosophy professor. I got my PhD here in philosophy. I am not a member of the faculty of the business school at Wake Forest. So this talk will be slanted more towards the philosophy side, more towards the honesty, and a little less towards the work side, um, but I'll have plenty to say about work as well, okay? Um, but I hope I, it doesn't come across as too naive or simple-minded. Um, all righty, ready to go? <laughs> Are we ready to go? Yes. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, <clears throat> honesty at work. This is part of the work that we're doing here, I was already mentioned, for the Honesty Project. Uh, we are in year, year two of three, thanks to Templeton funding. And if you wanna learn more about our project, please feel free to visit our website. Here's what I'm planning to do today. Uh, talk about four questions. Why is honesty important? What is honesty in the first place? Is the virtue of honesty widely possessed? And finally, what can be done in a business environment to foster greater honesty? So we're gonna cover a lot of grounds. It's gonna be a bit of a whirlwind. Are you ready for it? Okay, um, I'll skip if we need to, uh, if it's going too long, but uh, I think we can get it all in. Why is honesty important? I think for many reasons. There's a paradigm of honesty. We are inspired by exemplars of honesty like Abraham Lincoln. By acting honestly, we show respect for others and demonstrate that we value their autonomy. Honesty promotes trust and credibility and prevents harm. It also fosters healthy relationships and strengthens organizations and societies. So it turns out uh, from my perspective and from what I've everything I've read about honesty that there's just little controversy that honesty is a virtue, it's important to cultivate in society in general, and it should be, I think, a good part, uh, part of a good moral education. Maybe I didn't even need to say that, maybe you already agree uh, to begin with, so let's move on. One more thing to mention, honesty is something that's deeply meaningful to people, deeply meaningful to me too, and garners a lot of attention when it is missing. Um, as it seems to have been there, and there, and sadly there. Students, do, do, do students catch that illusion anymore? <laughs> students, how many students know who those people are? Okay, still not, okay. Um, I have to check sometimes. Um, faculty, I know I have no clue, so um, they, can, they can ask you later on. And uh, uh, websites you do not want to visit, um, but that hundreds of thousands of people have. And business is no exception, of course, here. <laughs> Who's that? Students. How many students know who that is? <laughs> now, this is going to be a one that's going to date people. Okay. Who is it? Ken Lay. Ken Lay, who was? Uh, the CEO of Very nice. And the CEO of Enron. Excellent job. Who's that? <laughs> students. Helps that. Bernie Madoff, who is most known for? <laughs> Ponzi scheme and, uh, yeah, lots of unethical and uh, 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 dishonest behavior. And then, what's that? It's not just a symbol on a car. That's meant to represent what? What's that allusion to, yes? Yes, a recent scandal about uh, fraudulent emissions reporting. You could might say it that way. Um, Dieselgate, I like that, yeah, I hadn't heard that name. Um, okay, so business is no exception. Uh, we certainly uh, want there to be honesty. I think it's important, and we pay attention when it's absent, and it gets a lot of attention when it's absent. Moving on, though. What are we even talking about when we're talking about honesty? I'm a philosopher. We always gotta start by defining our terms, being real clear what we mean. So I'm gonna give you some distinctions and then my definition, and you can see what you think of it. So one question you could ask later on is, uh, I don't know if I buy that definition. What about this problem, or this problem, or this problem? And I'd love to hear that. 
I'm not gonna be focused primarily on actions which we describe as honest, such as Smith did the honest thing and telling the truth on the stand of the courtroom, nor on momentary thoughts which we describe as honest, such as Jones carried out a thorough and honest assessment of the evidence in the case. My focus is what is referred to by statements like this, Roberts is an honest person, I spent enough time with him to know that he is really dishonest and you don't want to be his friend. <clears throat> her honesty really stands out in her application. We should definitely hire her. <clears throat> These are statements about what? <clears throat> character. <clears throat> My focus is on <clears throat> honesty understood as a character trait, a part of someone's character, which gives rise to <clears throat> thoughts and behavior, but is more fundamental <clears throat> than they are. In particular, it's not just any old character trait. Character traits come in different varieties. There are good character traits, those are the virtues. There are bad character traits, those are the vices. So honesty is obviously one of the good ones. It's a virtue, so let's unpack it a little bit more. It's a part of our psychology. For those people who are honest, it's part of their minds. Uh, it's part of how they think about the world and view the world. <clears throat> it's also an excellence of character. It's something that's really good, intrinsically good. Um, to have with a cognitive component, so a thinking component to honesty. An honest person thinks a certain way, has certain beliefs. <clears throat> An effective and a motivational component, they also feel certain things, they're motivated in certain ways. <clears throat> and also a behavioral component, they act a certain way. An honest person does certain actions and doesn't do other actions. And those actions had better be cross-situationally consistent so would it be strange if you said, an honest person only tells the truth in the courtroom? That'd be strange, wouldn't it? As if it was never anywhere else, so uh, honesty was relevant? No, it's gotta be a courtroom, classroom, home, office, party, etc. cetera. Even uh, the football game. Um, stable over time as well. So it's not just today, but it's tomorrow, it's the next day, the next week, the next year, okay? So those are some features of the behavior uh, that you would expect of an honest person who has the virtue of honesty. Um, there are a couple seats up. There's one there and one there, for people coming in. Um, and today I'm gonna focus just on a couple of those. And when we have time to go really deep into this, if we're gonna get it anywhere else as well, I'm gonna focus a little bit on the motivational components and on the behavioral component of honesty. Start with the behavior. <laughs> It is surprisingly wide-ranging, this virtue of honesty. It covers a lot of moral ground. It's really broad in scope. It pertains to and works against, of course, lying. That's what you think of, first of all, right? An honest person doesn't lie, but there's a lot more than that. Cheating, as well. Stealing, promise breaking, hypocrisy, self-deception. <clears throat> BSing, I better put it that way, just to make sure I don't get in trouble, uh, and misleading, where I say it's true things with the intention of trying to get you to draw false conclusions <clears throat> when I do something misleading, and more than that too. Fraud, for example, is another thing that could be on the list. So it covers a lot of moral territory. It's extremely broad in scope. If that's right, well, what is it at its core? What is it about honesty that covers all that ground, that all those things have in common, that is at the center of this virtue of honesty? I'll just tell you what my proposal is. I won't go into a lot of detail, but you can certainly ask afterwards. I think at its core, to be an honest person is to centrally and reliably be disposed <clears throat> to not intentionally distort the facts as the person sees them. So it's negative. A person who's honest doesn't do this. They don't distort the facts as they see those facts to be. Now that's very, I came to a business lecture and now we're getting into really abstract philosophy. What, did I, what in the world am I doing here? Um, well, first of all, philosophy is great. Um, secondly, I'm gonna unpack it a little bit more. So let me uh, explain this a little bit more to make it more digestible and I'll give an example too. Reliably. That's that business about cross-situational. It's gotta be across a, lot of, a variety of different situations and also reliably over time. Distort, I just mean misrepresent. Nothing fancy here. Uh, an honest person doesn't misrepresent or manufacture or fabricate uh, or distort, what I have there, the facts. 
intentionally as opposed to accidentally. So you would not um, lose any honesty points if you walk out of a store without paying for something, if it accidentally fell into your pocketbook. You didn't do it on purpose. That doesn't detract from your honesty. But if you did it on purpose, intentionally, you took that banana, you put it into your bag or your pocket or something like that and walked out on purpose, then that's something different. That is gonna uh, lose honesty points, so to speak, uh, metaphorically. And then the facts. Well, um, lots to be said here. Uh, I just wanna say something briefly. It doesn't, for me, matter whether you are tracking the truth. Honesty pertains to how you see the world, even if that is radically mistaken. Let me give you an example. I'll, I'll skip over the, t- the details are gonna be on the slide here. Um, if you sincerely believe the earth is flat, you're mistaken. Uh, but if someone asks you, what's the shape of the earth? And you say, the earth is flat. You're not losing anything when it comes to honesty. You're being honest. Right? Agreed? So if that's what you sincerely believe, and someone asks you, what is the shape of the earth? And you say, the earth is flat. You're saying something false, but you're being honest in the process. You're representing to the other person how you see the world. It's the facts as you see them. Whereas if you believe that the earth is flat, and someone says, what's the shape of the world? And you say, because you don't want to get in trouble or you don't want to cause any ruckus or anything like that, you say, oh yeah, of course the earth is round. If you're saying something true, but you're being dishonest in the process. Um, so honesty tracks the world as we see it, as opposed to the world as it actually is. Uh, that's, that's the point of all this, and that was the example there, but I th- try to condense it down a little bit. All right, to give an illustration, here, to make it um, a little bit more digestible, let's see how this works in the case of lying. Here's the application of what I said. An honest person reliably does not intentionally distort the facts as she believes them to be by telling lies about those facts to others, especially if those lies are more than just everyday or white lies, although I don't even think we need to say that, because even uh, everyday or white lies are still going to be dishonest on my approach. Um, so, Smith tells the teacher that the dog ate his homework. Did anyone ever actually try that? I don't know if anyone ever tries that. I mean, that's a, it's kind of a crazy example, but it's such a classic example. I might as well use it anyway. So, um, now, of course, Smith doesn't believe that the dog ate his homework. He's making this up. He knows what really happened. He didn't do his homework. So, is he misrepresenting or distorting the facts to his teacher? Yeah, right? Is he being dishonest or failing to be honest? Yes, right? Um, So that's what I have in mind. Here, an example like that. Uh, He has his way of thinking about what happened, which is he was just lazy, but that's not what he communicates to his teacher. He fabricates what happened. He distorted or misrepresented the facts in his communication with his teacher, and thereby he fails to be honest. Does that make sense? Somewhat? Yes, be honest. Um, If it doesn't make sense, uh, let me know afterwards and I'll be happy to clarify some more. Okay, so that's some of the behavioral side of honesty. How about internally? Well, I think it has to be more than just behavioral. There's a motivation behind our actions and that matters too. So if you tell the truth, but you do it just to make a good impression on a significant other, are you being virtuous? If you tell the truth in order to just to avoid being punished, are you being virtuous? If you're telling the truth just to get rewards in the afterlife, are you being virtuous? I say no, right? So it's not enough to be a virtuously honest person that you just do these actions, telling the truth, not cheating, not stealing, not breaking promises and the like of that. Your heart matters as well. Clear what the point is? Well, um, let's add that. It needs to be for good or virtuous motivating reasons why you're not intentionally distorting the facts. But of course, that just invites the question, well, what are these good reasons? What is a good motive for telling the truth? And what is a bad motive when it comes to the virtue of honesty? I'm gonna say something bold and probably too extreme here. 
Uh, you can call me out on it later if you want. So I'm going to exclude all self-interested motivating reasons. So if your motivation is primarily for your own benefits, then that's not going to count as virtuous or uh, 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 virtuous when it comes to honesty. Okay. If your primary reason for doing the action is just so you can benefit yourself, that's not going to count. But otherwise, I'm going to be quite pluralist. I'm going to open the door to lots of different possibilities of what an honest motivation could look like, and I'll give an example. Why, didn't you, why did you tell the truth about your past business failures when it would have been so much easier to lie? He deserved to hear the truth. How's that sound to people? Does that sound okay? That's a reasonable answer. And uh, would you fault a person's character if that was the answer? No, right? I don't lie to my friends. How's that sound? Sounds okay, doesn't it? Sounds okay to me. It's important for us to be able to trust each other. That also sounds okay to me. And I would not have been honest, or it would not have been honest. Right? So these are four different answers. They're not the same. You can't, I don't think, collapse them into each other. And I think they're all fine. So I think there, we can allow lots of different motivations for honest behavior to count as virtuously honest. Here's another example. Why did you cheat on the test when you could have gotten away with it? That would not have been fair. That sounds fine to me. I don't want to disrespect Professor Miller. That sounds the best, right? That's clear. We rank down with number one, and the other ones are still going to be okay, but not quite as good as that one. What if everyone were to cheat? That would be a terrible world to live in. If you like Floster Kant, um, it would not have been honest. Get the point? Loving motives for honest behavior seem to me fine because I care about the other person. Justice motives, because it would have been fair or would not have been fair. Friendship motives, because she's my friend. As well as dutiful motives, because it was the right thing to do. Honesty motives, because it would have been dishonest. Your heart can be in different places and you can still be an honest person when you act honestly. So long as it's not primarily self-interested. That's the idea. Uh, and I am skeptical that we're going you know, to collapse these down into one particular fundamental motive. So I just say, why bother? Allow lots of different possibilities to count. OK. Let's get our breath, or let me get my breath for a second. We're hanging in there OK? Two questions down, two to go. So the first one was, why should we care about this in the first place? Why is this important? Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that it is, honesty. The second one is, what are we even talking about when it comes to honesty? What is this virtue? Can we unpack it a little bit more? Maybe get a little bit of an, a definition going? We've tried now. Third question, how are we doing today? Now, I'm not going to ask you. I'm just talking about it in general. How honest are people today? And for that kind of question, I can't be just a philosopher. I need something more tractable. I can't just sit in my proverbial armchair and think really hard and say, oh, the answer is 90% uh, of people are honest today. I, would, I guess I could say that, but that'd be kind of crazy. Um, so we're going to shift gears a little bit and go more empirical. Any psychology majors here or minors? Oh, boy. Wow. OK. Um, good, so you can't, you can't get me in trouble then. I guess I'll, I'll look at it that way. Um, we're going to go a little bit of psychology and draw on some interesting research there. <clears throat> Before we do, let's see what some options are for answering that question. <clears throat> you could say most people have the virtue of honesty. You could say most people have the vice of dishonesty. You could say most people occupy a middle space between honesty and dishonesty. <clears throat> Let me stop right there. Curious. Uh, when I say, by the way, occupy middle space, like you know, partially honest, partially dishonest, or kind of a mixed bag, um, some good sides, some bad sides to their character when it comes to this, this topic. Um, I'm going to force you to vote. Well, you don't have to vote, but I'm going to force you to choose between these three options. If you don't want to vote, that's fine. How many people would go with, with the first option? Most people have the virtue of honesty. <clears throat> How many people go with the second option? Most people have the vice of dishonesty. <laughs> How many people go with the third option? <clears throat> middle space. <laughs> Wow, very good. Um, we'll see what I think in a second. Um, but I guess I already tipped my hand a little bit. Uh, 
I'm going to be right along with the majority of you in thinking the same thing. Now, here's a couple other options. So I didn't give you these uh, just because I wanted to keep it a little simpler. But you could split people up between some having the virtue of honesty and others having the vice of honesty, of dishonesty. You could say it's roughly equal between the three options, and you could say other things too. I'm just kind of, kind of keep it a little bit manageable and have five options up for us to look at. <clears throat> What's the correct one? Well, it's just, again, hard to just decide that right, um, right now. I mean, just by thinking about it, we're not going to be able to decide that. <laughs> so I turn to research in psychology, in behavioral economics, in business as well, which looks at how people behave in a variety of different contexts to see whether they lie, cheat, steal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm gonna be honest, seems appropriate, about the limitations of this data. So here's one limitation right off the bat. Almost all these studies involve Western populations and there are almost no longitudinal studies. So tracking the same people over time across a variety of situations, which would be really helpful to see. There are almost no studies like that. Um, and frankly, there's just not enough good data to assess honesty in general. So that's kind of pessimistic. You might think, well, what, what are we gonna do then? I mean, you said this is gonna be a three, section three out of four. I mean, what, what can we say then? Uh, so look, there's not much on stealing, promise breaking, deceiving, but there's a fair amount of research on lying and cheating. And so I wanna dip into that just a little bit, and at least in this area, I'll draw a preliminary conclusion. Okay, clear where we are, where we're going? Let's go there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do next is give you three representative studies. Three studies, I think the, um, they're not the only ones, of course. They're, if we had a lot of time, I'd give you dozens and dozens of them and put you all to sleep. Um, but I'll just give you three and then say what these kinds of studies suggest to me. 2013, Brian there told online participants about recent evidence for the paranormal. Have you heard about this? No, I haven't either. Um, <laughs> because I guess he was dishonest in making it up. Uh, but anyway, that's not part of the central part of the study, um, well, I mean, fake evidence for the paranormal, <laughs> asked them to find a coin to flip 10 times while trying to influence the outcome of each flip of their minds. Try really hard to get the flips to turn out uh, the right way. What is the right way? Well, you'd receive a dollar for each time you got heads. So you know, try with your mind really hard to get those flips to turn out heads. You think they're gonna turn out heads? Well, he didn't. He said, "Like, no, don't, don't cheat. Just tell us the, honestly what you get, and that's what the instructions say. Even a small amount of cheating would undermine the study." And yes, participants reported 6.22 heads, well above chance. Now, maybe their minds really did manipulate the coins, and that's what they got. Do you buy that? If you do buy that. I could sell you lots of other things too. Um, so you're not supposed to buy that, right? Clearly some cheating is going on. Here's another one, 2011. This is a die roll task. So you would be paid based upon what your die roll you got. $1 for one, $2 for two, et cetera. In a single roll condition, you roll it one time, you see the results and you report the results. But only you can see the results. No one else can see the results, <laughs> right? See that idea? idea? You roll it, you look at, you know, no one else can see it. You get a one and you report, I got a six. You could do that, no questions asked. Or you could report a one, because that's the honest thing. In a multiple roll condition, you were supposed to report the results of the first roll, but also rolled at least two more times to make sure the die was legitimate. Uh, but still, just tell us what you got in the first one. Hmm. Average payment was about $4 in the single roll and about four and a half for the multiple roll. Is that what Chance would predict? I don't think so. 34% of participants in the multiple roll condition reported a six. I don't think 34% got a six. Okay. Last one and then I'll move on. Uh, this is one of my favorite setups, kind of designs. Anyone know this? Um, this research here, this is a shredder paradigm. Anyone come across this? Um, no, okay. So uh, each participant completed a worksheet with 20 problems, paid 50 cents per correct answer. <sighs> no, you didn't, in the control condition, the participants had no opportunity to cheat. They just did their best on the test. 
they uh, turned it in and it was graded for them and they got paid accordingly. <clears throat> Shredder condition. Here the difference was that they did their best on the test, but they didn't turn it in. They got to grade it themselves. <clears throat> so they got to decide how they did and report how they did in quotation marks and destroy all their materials. So what would you do if you were in that situation? Don't tell me. Don't wait. Introspectively, what would you do? Would you fudge a little bit? I got, I really got five, but hey, you know, who's going to know? Hey, I got 10. Don't tell me. Just think about it. Um, that's not the real shredder, but I guess the idea across of the shredder, not the real shredder that was used, but here's the interesting part. So the baseline, where there's no opportunity to cheat, about eight problems answered correctly. Opportunity to cheat, whoa, 13.22. You think that second group was that much smarter? It could be, right? You have to agree it's possible. It is possible. And you want to buy it? But that's the explanation? The second group was just so much smarter at taking the test? Anyone want to buy that? Uh, because I'd love to sell you some other things, too. <laughs> they cheated, right? We know what the real explanation is. So, uh, more generally, from those three studies, you're not going to be able to conclude much. But when you aggregate lots and lots and lots of studies in this area, some tendencies and some patterns emerge. Across many studies, the majority of participants will often engage in cheating behavior when they think they can get away with it, and there is some non-trivial reward associated with cheating. But... When participants do cheat in the behavioral tasks, it's usually to a moderate degree and almost never the full amount they were able to. Notice it was 14, not 20, right? And notice in the die roll, it wasn't six on average. And if notice in the coin flipping, it wasn't 10 heads. Uh, so those are some general observations. And there's even a, now a leading psychological explanation for what's going on. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but I, I'm happy to refer you to more uh, research in this area if you're interested. So now there's a dominant paradigm, or maybe a better way to put it, just a dominant uh, approach or model, psychological model, for explaining research like what you just saw. It has four parts to it, or four pieces, I guess. Yeah, four parts, I think that's, that's fine to say. Um, most people want to cheat, including most of us. If, by doing so, they can benefit themselves in some way, it makes the cheating seem worthwhile, and if they think they can get away with it and not get caught. At the same time, most of us also believe that cheating is wrong. It's not like we've never thought about that, or we weren't raised to think a certain way about this matter. We do genuinely believe it's wrong, but at the same time, we want to cheat if we think we can get away with it. In addition, we want others to think of ourselves as honest people. Does that make sense? I mean, don't you, can you relate to that? I want you to think of me as a good person in general, and specifically as an honest person. But I also want to think of myself as an honest person. So most people want to think of themselves, not just what other people think of them, but they want to be able to think of themselves, their self-concepts, as honest. So it's really hard to cheat with abandon and still think of yourself as an honest person. It's really hard uh, to go all the way to 20 problems answered correctly and still think of yourself as an honest person. So this kind of desire will limit, typically, how much people are willing to cheat and keep it in check, but still allow, because of the first one, uh, still allow some cheating to happen. All right. Wrapping this section up and getting to the business next. Uh, when you combine what we've done, how does this story fit with what you would think an, ex an honest person is like? How do these research results, how does this psychological story map onto what you would expect of an honest person? Thumbs down. Is this the mindset you'd expect of an honest person? And I say no. Um, I say and the research such as it is, what we have available to us, gives us good reason to think that most people are not honest. Now, I don't say anything in this talk. Um, this point doesn't 
really get you the laser. But anyway, uh, to differentiate between the middle space and the right-hand side. So if you're wondering why do I have the arrow in the middle space in between honesty and dishonesty as opposed to just going all the way to the right-hand side. I mean, look, these people cheated in the coin flip, they cheated in the uh, shredder condition, and they cheated in the, in the uh, dice roll condition. Um, that looks like it's pretty dishonest. Ask me afterwards. Okay. Deal? I'd love to talk about that. Um, I go with the middle space. All righty. Um, keep an eye on the time and making sure we have plenty of time for question and answer. Let's get to the last section. How can this be tied back to business and trying to foster honesty specifically in the business environment? How many of you are business students? All right, all right. So you can tell me where I go wrong here, correct me, uh, and also tell me other areas where this could be fruitful or to think about more. Uh, in our remaining time, I want to focus on two areas. Filtering and bringing forth is what I'm going to call them. Filtering is going to involve filtering applicants and trying to weed out applicants who are more honest as opposed to less, so screen applicants. And this will also apply to promotion within the company as well. I'm going to give a specific suggestion here, which is a matter of uh, looking at guilt proneness, and I'll explain what that means in a second. And then the other one is going to be bringing forth. So for those people who are already in a company or a business, not those who are applying to come in, but are already in the company, uh, how could we draw out the better sides of employees' mixed character when it comes to matters of honesty and avoid the worst side? Yeah. Promote honesty uh, more within the, the business or company. I'll give you several proposals there. Okay, so the filtering first. Um, this is going to draw on the research of one of my collaborators and fellow team members of the Honesty Project, Taya Cohen who I've learned today was actually funded, some of her research was funded by the center here, the Notre Dame Ethics Center. So um, very, very appropriate and relevant. Uh, she defines guilt proneness as, or the, uh, the construct captures the extent to which a person would feel bad about their behavior if they did something wrong, even if no one knew about what had happened. Think about it in your own life. To what extent do you feel guilty? when you do something bad or wrong, or would feel guilty if you were to do an action without actually having done it yet. So people who are high on guilt proneness feel bad about mistakes and transgressions. They can anticipate such feelings before they behave badly, which helps them act more responsibly and ethically. Those are her words again. And they also tend to feel a higher degree of interpersonal responsibility. So she has a measure, uh, actually a couple of measures, but the one I'm mentioning here is the GP5, which is a five item guilt prone scale. Here's an example of one of the items. You lie to people, but they never find out about it. What is the likelihood that you would feel terrible about the lies you told? Ask yourself. Don't tell me, but ask yourself. Uh, which you would, uh, how you would respond to that. And here are some of the results that she's found when she uses this measure of guilt proneness to investigate honesty and dishonesty. And this is pretty cool. <clears throat> so guilt proneness is associated with lower lying among MBA students in negotiations. So the higher guilt proneness someone has, the less likely they are going to lie, as well as guilt proneness being associated with fewer counterproductive work behaviors. <clears throat> what are those? Here are some examples. Stolen something belonging to your employer. Put in to be paid for more hours than you worked. Took money from your employer without permission. Stole something belonging to someone at work. What all four of these have in common? They're dishonest, right? Sorry. <coughs> um, the failures of honesty, right? So not, not all counterproductive work um, uh, behaviors are going to be matters of honesty, but these are, and others are as well. So to make this a little bit more uh, concrete and specific, the correlation between guilt proneness and these kind of behaviors was found to be negative 0.33. What does that mean? That, that doesn't, unless you're familiar with this, it doesn't mean much. Is that small or large? Here's an illustration of how big it is. Assume a company hired 100 employees, half of whom were high in guilt proneness, half of whom were low. We can estimate that 66 of the employees low in guilt proneness would engage in these behaviors frequently, whereas only 34 of the employees high in guilt proneness would engage in them. That's a pretty big difference, isn't it? 
That's, now we're talking about something pretty significant. Um, and of course, it's not saying that there's never going to be anyone, but if you want one criteria that could help weed out or filter, this looks like one that could make a significant difference. Uh, one more illustration of this. Uh, this is um, standard deviations so with respect to these counterproductive work behaviors on the, on the uh, left-hand side, uh, the, the y-axis, and then differences in guilt proneness on the x-axis. And you can see um, same trends for counterproductive work behavior and for delinquency, not showing up for work and then lying about uh, why you're not at work, for, for example. Okay, um, last topic for today, and I've got about five minutes, so I think I'm in good shape. So that was the filtering side. What can we do from a business perspective to try and uh, discern who's more honest and who is less, and then hire those who are more honest? What about people who are already in the company? How can we create a more um, honest, promoting, or conducive environment for those people? Well, we want to try to draw out the better side of employees' mixed character when it comes to matters of honesty and avoid the worst side. Because if I'm right, you can assume that most employees are not honest. So there's somewhere in this middle, there you've got a mixed bag, a kind of character, a mixed character. And so we want to do things that will draw out the positive side and avoid activating or triggering the negative side of character. Lots of things that could be investigated here. I'm going to just skim through a couple and only probe a little bit deeper into two of them. So I'm just, I know this will fly by. Um, so here, first of all, avoiding the worst side. Avoid dishonesty in public facing communication, which can make dishonest behavior at work seem justifiable. So make sure the public facing communication mirrors and maps onto and corresponds to the internal views about the matter. Avoid creating an institutional environment of dishonesty internally in the business, which can make it seem justifiable. Of course, how do you do that? Um, I'm not going to look into that in detail, but it seems maybe obviously uh, almost applied to this that that would be a good thing to do. And adopt strict workplace punishments for dishonest behavior. So sending the message that this is taken very seriously, and there's uh, little tolerance for such behavior. Now, for all these, you can ask the question, a quite reasonable question, will any of this help to foster honesty as opposed to avoiding dishonesty? And that's something I'd be happy to talk about. Um, is it going to create the right kind of motivation? Is it actually going to help promote the virtue? That's a fair question. I want to focus in our remaining time on the other side of this bringing forth. Uh, so to try to draw out the better side of employees' mixed character when it comes to matters of honesty. What could be done there? Uh, focus on the positive as opposed to avoiding the negative. And here I'll have two suggestions. Um, have managers and other company leaders role model honesty and then have regular more reminders of the values of the company and the importance of honesty. They might already be fairly straightforward what it's meant here, but let me expand just a little bit. Uh, when it comes to role models, here's another uh, picture of Lincoln again. I mean, it, when you think of role models in the American history of honesty, he's usually the, the go-to person. Here's the point. When you see exemplars, when you see people who are high on a trait like honesty, they can be inspirational. You can look to them and you can admire them but admire them in a way in which you just not at a distance, but admire them in such a way that you want to become more like them. You want your life and your behavior to better reflect how they're living their life and their behavior. So um, it needn't be that the uh, managers or executives are really exemplary in honesty, but it would be nice if they acted that way. And if they acted that way, that can have a trickle-down effect in inspiring and role modeling honesty for other people who look to them uh, for guidance. Okay, So um, this is playing off of lots of research on the effect of how people behave in the environment and looking to how people behave in the environment to sort to see how I'm going to behave. And if people in the environment are behaving badly, I'm much more likely to behave badly myself. 
the people in the environment, especially people who I look up to, who are above me in certain ways, are behaving well, I'm much more likely to behave well myself too. And then the last point, reminders. Regular moral reminders can serve to make our moral commitments salient and work against solely pursuing our self-interest. This is not just limited to the business context. This applies to education. It applies to all kinds. It applies to religion, con religious context as well. <clears throat> Look, I said earlier, most people do believe that cheating is wrong. It would help just to call that to mind more often and have that be more at the forefront of our psychology and our consciousness to work against temptation to cheat or to lie or to steal or to break promises or anything else. Okay. In the business context, one t form this could take is business codes of ethics. And business students, how many of you study this in your classes? <laughs> ethics codes? Some of you have? Okay. Um, interested, uh, tell me afterwards uh, what what's, um, perspective was adopted. Is it a more skeptical perspective, a more supporter perspective, more neutral perspective? I'd be interested to hear what, uh, what the take was there. Um, these are written, distinct, and formal documents, which consist of, put in the plural, uh, which consist of moral standards used to guide employee or corporate behavior. Not all companies have them. Uh, in one study of the top 200 companies, 52% of companies have these ethics codes. So they're, they're widely used, but not uh, exhaustively used. The idea here is you have this kind of ethics code, not just as window dressing, or a mere formality, but something you take extremely seriously. So it is uh, rich, nuanced, uh, very well formulated, but also widely known, repeatedly reinforced, maybe to the extent to which there's training involved in gaining deeper acquaintance and familiarity with ethics. There's, a, I think, a great quote from 1924, one of the very first comments on ethics codes, way back when, almost 100 years ago. The code of ethics is not a cure-all and possesses no magic powers by which it can change moral darkness into light. But it is an effective instrument which now contributes much and which with proper use can be made to contribute much more to the cause of truth and honor in business relationships. That's a very optimistic sentiment. Um, in 1924, is it backed up by the research? Those of you who studied in class, what, it, what, 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 what sense did you get? Was there research backing this up or not? Did you, did you, did you get any message along those lines who studied uh, ethics codes? No? Okay. Um, maybe this might have been wise because um, the research is a mixed bag. Uh, some studies find that these are effective, some find that they're not. Uh, it also varies the extent to which they are mere formalities or they're ex uh, extensively employed within the corporate context. So it is a mixed bag. Um, and when it comes to honesty and his dishonesty specifically, there's almost no work. Um, but I'll end with this. Does Notre Dame have an honor code? Do you have to sign an honor code here? It's like a code of ethics. Not in the business world, but in the educational world. We have one at Wake Forest, too. Um, they're extremely effective, I think. This is a study uh, using the Shredder paradigm again. Control condition, Shredder condition, Shredder plus honest on our code condition. Cheating disappeared. When participants first had to sign on our code, and then they were in the Shredder condition, they didn't cheat even when the financial reward increased. It's quite stunning. 28% of college students at schools without an honor code report helping another person on a test versus 9% of schools with an honor code. Plagiarism, unauthorized crib notes, unpermitted collaboration, all significantly impacted. What's this have to do with anything? It's an illustration of the idea of the importance of a code of ethics and where there is actually resource backing up the effectiveness of it. Here's in the educational context, 
But the hope is that it could carry over to other contexts too, including the business context. Unfortunately, the results are mixed uh, there, but I think they're uh, obvious parallels. And so it's more of an expression of hope than it is anything definitive that there will be this carryover in the business context too. <clears throat> Do any of these strategies sound promising? Are there others besides them? I want to hear what you have to say. Thanks for putting up with me on a Thursday afternoon in a dark, typical, uh, cold South Bend day. And I'm done. Thank you. Um, so we have a microphone here. And I have a rule, which is students go first. I told you that at the beginning. Love to hear student questions. Yes. And uh, okay, uh, give him a chance. Uh, thank you for coming here and speaking today. My question is, do you believe that honesty is an absolute good which should be pursued to the maximum in all situations, mm -hmm. or should it be tempered by other values such as not wanting to hurt another person or mac minimizing suffering? Super question. Um, you sure, are you a philosophy major? Have you ever thought about it? Okay. <laughs> Do it, do it. Um, uh, so, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm gonna do some recruitment while I'm here. Um, so, super question. I think it's not an absolute value. Um, so, this could get me in trouble um, in some ways, especially in the Catholic tradition. It's, I'm gonna depart from the Catholic tradition. Certain uh, paradigms who have thought about this, like Augustine, I'm gonna depart from him. So, let me answer it by giving you an example. Uh, it's the famous Nazi at the door example. So in this example from World War II, you're hiding a uh, Jewish family in the basement. The North Nazis are doing a routine patrol of the neighborhood, knocking on each door, just asking, do you know where any Jews are? Um, you know if you say no, they'll just say bye and go to the next door, not going to ask the same question. Um, so you're... Uh, you're, in the, you're in your house, here comes the knock, you open the door, there's a Nazi, says, do you know where any Jews are? Let me ask everyone. Uh, how many of you would tell the truth and say, yes, there are some in the basement? How many of you would, would lie and say, no, I don't know where any Jews are? Um, that's, that's kind of the answer to the question right there. Um, now, to expand on that a little bit more, uh, if, if honesty were absolute in the sense that you're talking about, where um, nothing is more important than it, then you've got to tell the truth. Um, unless you can somehow make an argument that answering, I don't know where any Jews are, is still being honest. Uh, and I can talk about the ways in which you might be able to make that argument, but um, it seems like a stretch. Uh, so what's going on here is that another virtue is coming into play, compassion. Maybe. Uh, compassion for the Jewish family. And so we have a, a, a now a tension between honesty and compassion. We need to weigh those two virtues against each other, and I think in this case, compassion gets the upper hand. But it doesn't always. It's not a fixed ranking. It's not a fixed hierarchy here, because there are other cases in which it flips, and honesty would have the upper hand over compassion. Uh, but honesty by itself is not absolute. Uh, does that speak to your question? Yes. Yeah, right. Thank you. Great question. Yep. Um, other students? Please, over here. Yes. Um, do you think it's possible to have, like, purely no self-interest when doing, like, honest work, yeah. even to the point of, like, keeping your reputation intact or makes you feel good or yeah. Yeah. things along those lines? Not your primary focus, but... Yeah, no, no, no. It's a great question. No, no, no. Absolutely. Are you a philosophy major? No. <laughs> He's a great... Uh, I, I, would, I would have no idea. I think I would be was talking to a philosophy class here. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, is it possible? Uh, I think it's possible. Um, but possibility is a low bar. Lots of things are possible, right? It's possible for me to be president of the United States, but it's not going to happen. Um, so how often does it happen that we have like pure motives, pure moral motives when it comes to telling the truth and so forth? I don't, I don't know if there's any research that can really give me a basis for saying confidently. Um, I think it happens probably rarely. Um, but two, two points. Um, Mixed motives, and then um, feeling good and happy. So let me take them in reverse order. You could um, feel good about yourself and about your reputation 
uh, when you tell the truth without ha that having been your motive in the first place. It could be a side effect or a byproduct. So you might tell the truth to someone, and as a byproduct of that, you also feel good. Just like you can help someone who needs help, your focus is on helping the other person, but afterwards you feel you know, kind of good about yourself. You were helping the person in order to feel good about yourself. You're helping the person because the person needed help. Just like, and you were telling the truth because you think it's important to tell the truth, but in the process, as a byproduct, you feel good too. That's, I think it's perfectly fine. That makes, makes sense um, to me. But um, what about mixed motives? Where your motivation is partially virtuous and also partially self-interested. And there you have two goals. Um, say, I'm, I'm telling the truth because I think it's, the truth is important, and I'm also telling the truth because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, is that what you had in mind originally? Yeah. Yep, yep. I think that happens a lot. Um, now, is that compatible with virtue? If it's not, then virtue is going to be extremely rare. So I don't want to say that. Um, and I think it is compatible with virtue, so long as the motives are in the right relationship to each other. So um, motives come in degrees, and their strengths, and weak, you know, strength, stronger, weaker motives. The stronger motive had better be the honest motive. And it can be supplemented or supported by a self-interested motive, too. Um, that's fine if, when, we, when it comes to the, uh, the honest person. I have no problem with that. But if you flip it around and you say, okay, there's these mixed motives in this honest person, um, but they're always such that the person's primarily interested in self-benefit and has some like minor interest in telling the truth for its own sake. I don't think that's virtuous. Does that help? Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. Yes, here, uh, yeah. What factors do you think determine someone's honesty? Like, is it cultural? Is it um, other factors? Or what's, what do you think goes into someone's honesty? Yeah, um, that's a big question. Uh, let me just say a couple of quick things about it. So, um, sorry, I'm going to sneeze too. Nope. Got it. Okay. Sure. Um, what factors that could contribute to someone's being honest in a particular moment? And also, what factors could contribute to someone's level of trade honesty? Like, how honest they are as a person in general? Those are two different questions. Um, in general, when it, we come, let me focus on the trait one. Um, moral character traits have a number of factors that contribute to them. There may be a genetic component to them. Um, there's some evidence, I don't know about honesty specifically, but there's some evidence that uh, a variety of personality traits, including some moral traits, have a genetic component. Uh, no doubt there's a upbringing component as well, what kind of um, upbringing you had. Uh, no doubt there's, uh, or maybe there's no doubt, but I think there's good reason to think that your own intentional efforts can also shape your character. So uh, do you embark upon a um, regimen of um, exercise to improve your self-control? Um, do you embark upon this in order to improve this other trait? You can take concrete steps to improve your and change your own character. Um, and then there's no doubt that, I, no, I say no doubt here too, I, I think there's no doubt is, is right, that there are environmental factors that impinge upon your character um, and influence whether your character is going to be um, triggered or not or activated or not in a given situation. So, um, when it comes to honesty, I've already given a couple of illustrations of that. Um, how dishonest people are being in the environment is gonna matter a lot to whether you are going to be honest in that moment, but also how honest you're going to be over time. If you're in an environment where repeatedly people are being dishonest around you, that is going to nudge your character to be more dishonest as well. Um, so to sum it up, uh, genetics, upbringing, your own volitional control and external environmental factors all play a role, I think. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, um, a lot more to be said there, but that's as, about as brief as I can give it, yeah. Um, so, more students, and then we can open it up to everyone. <clears throat> yes, over there. Oh wait, yes, okay, good. Uh, really quickly. Um, 
how much honesty is acceptable? Like, is this a countdown to zero or is it a zero, dis, uh, zero dishonesty or can we accept as a society a certain amount of dishonesty? Yeah. Um, I guess it's acceptable to whom is, I have to know that first. Um, acceptable to God? How much is it acceptable to God? Uh, or you phrase it in terms of dishonesty or honesty. So um, how much honesty do we want to have? Well, I guess it matters who's the judge. I, if, if we're talking about God, I think it's got to be maximal, perfect honesty. Um, if we're talking about ourselves, well, we set the standard that can fluctuate. You said in terms of society. Um, well, so society is different from one to the next in terms of where they set the bar for honesty. Some societies are going to have a higher bar than others. So it maybe depends on what society we're talking about. I'm, I'm being cagey and kind of dodging the question. I know that's what it sounds like, if I'm honest, um, uh, which I'm not. Um, um, I'm mixed. Uh, but um, let me give you a more direct answer, which is um, it seems like in answer to the earlier question, we don't have to strive for perfect honesty because there are going to be other values that come into play as well. We don't have to be strive for perfect honesty in, in all of our actions because there are other values that are going to come into play as well, like compassion and justice. Um, but I think we should strive for as much honesty as we can while also playing with these other values while also um, trying to balance these other virtues as well. So if there's no conflict with any other virtues, we should strive for maximum honesty. If there is conflict with other virtues, like compassion or justice, then we need to weigh those virtues against each other, and sometimes honesty has to fall to the side. Uh, I don't know if any of that spoke to your question, uh, but I think I first need to know, acceptable to whom? Over here, yes. When we encounter someone being dishonest with yeah. us, in most cases, what's your opinion on the best way to respond? <sighs> Boy, that's good. Um, it, part of me is to give, wants to give the philosophy answer, which is, it depends on the case. Um, give me an actual case, and then I'll know. It's hard to say in the abstract. Um, what I mean, that could take the form of cheating in a relationship, or it could take the form of a white lie, or it could take the form of a student plagiarizing a paper. Um, and I would want to say probably I need to think about each case, case by case, and how I might respond to the adultery case. But probably different than how I respond to the white lie case is probably different than how I respond to the student who's plagiarizing or, or, uh, or cheating academically. Um, is that fair, is the first point. Uh, hard to say in general. Second point, though, is um, I probably wouldn't do this because I'd probably be upset or angry. But I'd like to think I would first try and talk through the situation to understand why it happened. Um, why did you feel the need to play dirt? Not you. Why did you, imaginary person, feel the need to play dries on the test? What was going on? Let me understand the situation a little bit more before I rush to judgment and say you're going to fail the class. Um, and maybe I, you know, I, I hear some, some, some narrative about this adversity and this situation, and I might change my reaction and react differently than if I hadn't asked that question. So I guess that's what I would ideally want to do, but often I don't do that. I rush to judgment and get angry or annoyed, depending on what it is. Um, is, that, is, that, is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. Um, uh, if you have a particular case in mind, I can give you a more specific answer, but it, uh, that's the kind of in general answer. Uh, uh, um, Yeah, I, I think what I said would apply there too. Um, I would want to know what, what the reasons are as much as I can. Um, 
they might not be forthcoming about them, but I at least want to give them a chance to, to, I want to hear them out and give them an opportunity to be honest about their dishonesty. Um, if they're not, uh, then I mean, there are moral questions and there are just uh, kind of business questions, to be, to, for be, want of a better word here. Um, <clears throat> As far as the business questions are concerned, there's a question about whether they even have the employee work anymore, whether the, per the person needs to be fired or not. Um, I'm not a, uh, someone who employs people, so let me switch to the moral questions. Um, I would want to say, first of all, that the person did something wrong. Right? Other things being equal, without knowing any kind of excuse, excusing conditions or other virtues that were in, that were in play, my conclusion is, the person did something morally wrong, and it's blameworthy. Um, and so then the questions of desert answer, what does the person deserve? And questions of forgiveness come into the picture too. Um, is this person worthy of forgiveness? Uh, are they sh doing anything to atone for the wrongdoing that might merit forgiveness from me? And then we go from there. Um, you know, I, I do think forgiveness is extremely important. Uh, it's a virtue that's not talked about nearly enough and rarely ex uh, exercised, but uh, I think it's something that needs to be considered. So, I think we can do one, one last one. Okay. Um, I, I apologize, I'm not a student, but it, it has to do with what she just said. <laughs> um, Go what for it. A, what about on the flip side, you are an employee, mm -hmm. and it, the expectation is of honesty and you you provide honesty, but your employer doesn't um, take your honesty well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it may not be in your self-interest. Um, it may be actually damaging to your career um, and that the employer is in encouraging dishonesty in employees to advance in their careers. Um, Look, I, I don't have any easy answers here. Um, part of it depends on what's most important in life. Uh, so, and this gets into much broader philosophical questions like, um, does God exist? Is there a bigger meaning and purpose to all of this? Um, who, who, to whom do we owe ultimate allegiance? Is it to the employer or is it to a higher power? Um, even if God doesn't exist, um, what is the importance of morality relative to other values in life? Um, is doing the right thing more important than my own self-interest? If, which I think it is, um, if that's the case, then um, look, uh, I'm probably gonna take a hit, um, but my allegiance is to something higher. And I, I, uh, I, w I hope I would have enough integrity to stick to those higher, deeper values, even at the expense of my career. Of course, it's easy for me to say, very cushy job right, as a professor. When I'm, you know, if I was in a different situation and that happened, I'm trying to feed my family and a lot more hinges upon it, um, a lot harder thing to actually do. But I, at least I'd hope that that's what I would do. I would have enough integrity uh, and allegiance to what really matters in life that I would, um, I would be willing to go to bat for the right thing. So, thank you. Let's thank Professor.